Hi, we're here at the Portland Media Center for the uh, Civic IQ series where we're meeting each of the uh, candidates for mayor in the city of Portland. And I'm here today with uh, City Councilor Andrew Zaro. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So, uh, Andrew, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, your background? Uh, what, do, what do we need to know about you? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, as you said, uh, I'm the city councilor right now. I'm the representative for District 4. I was elected in 2020. Um, very different time to decide to throw your hat into municipal government. Um, and my partner and I live in Backhoff. We've been here for just about 10 years. I'm um, originally from Vermont. And I've always worked in a combination of public sector work that really, uh, I was a Main Street director, so I worked for uh, Boston Main Streets. Um, I've done a lot of work um, in social entrepreneurship. Uh, and then uh, I worked at the Gross, uh, Gross Smart Maine, the state's smart growth organization when I came to Maine, um, and worked all over the state um, in communities, uh, helping them address what mattered most to them while, while they were dealing with growth. Uh, I then decided to become a small business owner myself. So for the last six years, I owned a coffee shop in, a, in a first one was in Woodford's Corner and then moved downtown. Um, and that was really when I uh, lived my values of, of being very active in our community. Um, coffee shops are a great place to connect with people. Um, you know, I am one of those people who just for whatever reason loves, uh, I love municipal government. It's it's the closest you can get to constituents. Um, it's how you can impact people's lives in a way that's meaningful. Uh, it's less cerebral, right? It's tangible. You can bump into us at the grocery store, and sometimes that's why I will go grocery shopping outside. <laughs> really, um, but I, I am, uh, I'm, I just turned 35. I um, am the youngest person on the city council, and um, I really care a lot about. I mean, we live in one of the greatest cities, I think, in the country. Um, and I'm a big believer of civic engagement, so anything that I can do to get people excited about government is really important to me. Um, and you know how they can leave their fingerprints on policies that matter to them. Um, I think we, I've, I've noticed in my work uh, in the community, but also on the council, uh, that I'm seeing a lot of people starting to unplug and be apathetic. And, and I want to fix that because our democracy requires people to be engaged. So that's that's a big part of my call to action and, and why I care about this work. Um, so I'm really excited uh, at the prospects of, of being Portland's uh, fourth elected mayor um, because we need a new vision for the city. We need a new generation um, and we need people. We need someone who's going to bring the council together and someone who's going to bring the community together uh, to address the really significant challenges that we're facing as a city. Um, I've done that before in the public sector, in the private sector, on the council, um, and I'm, I'm ready to do it in this role. Uh, so this is my invitation to the entire community to join uh, in accomplishing that. Great, I'd like to explore a lot of those points you've just raised. Um, but first, uh, could you kind of take me back to uh, your earliest impressions of Portland and what was it when did you first come here? What were what kind of city was it? I was really little. <laughs> I was I was like baby. Um, so yeah, my family would always come to to Portland to Maine in the summer. I feel like people have three connections. If they're if they're not born and raised and stayed in Maine, they have three connections to Maine. They went to school here. They went to summer camp here, or or they married someone from here. Um, and so my connection was we would come here every year. Um, and Portland was a city that. Um, we would visit. Uh, we didn't stay in Portland, but it was, you know, it was the big city, right? It was the it was the metropolis of Maine. So we would come here for, you know, errands, but it was a city we never really stayed in when I was little. We would we would go through. Um, and then fast forward, um, I started coming to Portland uh, as a young adult. Um, and this was in like the late 2000s. Um, and I just thought it was the coolest city. Uh, it, it, you could do something here. You could have an impact. It was kind of gritty, but it but it cared. I mean, this you can almost feel the pulse of downtown Portland. You can feel that people are interconnected, and that was really attractive to me. So when all of my friends were moving to New York and San Francisco and Austin and Portland, Oregon, I moved. My partner and I moved to Portland, Maine, and we were twenty five, and. Um, Everyone thought I was nuts. Like, they're, what are you doing? Why aren't you going to a city where you can like you can focus on your career? You can do something. Well, to to me, this city is where you could do something. You can have an impact. So, um, Portland's 
a part of its appeal to me was that it wasn't this super polished, you know, place that you know you had to go to 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 check the box that you you made it there. This is a community that I was attracted to because it was the intersection of you know, small businesses and neighborhoods who really wanted to do the work themselves and, and show up and, and change their community the way they wanted. And it was a really inviting community. Um, it's you can for me, I, I felt at home here because I could be myself here. Um, so I know that it has changed so much in the in the decade that I've lived. How so? Um, it's becoming less accessible. I couldn't move here now. My partner, I could not move to Portland, Maine right now. And that's, you know, hopefully we'll get deeper into housing affordability, but it's become a city that has become, we, we are, we're a year round economy. We're the largest city in the state of Maine. And for some reason we are still treated as this destination to go, uh, for a couple, you know, for, for a vacation or you know, have get get a second or a third place here, and that's having really negative impacts on our local economy and our local housing market. So I know it's becoming unattainable. The people who made it that crunchy, cool community where everyone was all hands on at the same time, those people might live here, but they don't work here anymore because they can't. They can't afford to. So they're being pushed out to Westbrook, Biddeford, even more, you know, further further out places that are more rural. Um, and we're starting to see the impacts of it. I mean, I, I know the pandemic impacted everyone, but you know, Monday, Tuesday nights used to be when you would go downtown to see live music as a local and you would, you would get to see people. Businesses aren't open anymore because workers can't live here and the cost of um, doing business here is, is too much. So we're starting to see, and I know we are not the only city, lots of others in the country are dealing with this, but we're starting to see the very fabric of our community be pulled and and that tension is really showing up in in portlanders people need some people want something to be done um so while i still think the the core values of our city are the same we care deeply we're compassionate we're excited we want to get involved we're i think we're a city of helpers when something needs to be done we show up but now it's our turn as the electeds to help the people of portland live work and play here um so that's that's the most noticeable thing i've seen in the last so if you were two. to project forward 10 years um you know presumably you got elected that you've had two terms um which would be a first uh it would be a first. Uh, in um what's the city going to be like in uh, 2033 so under my plan um one of the most ambitious goals that i have that is attainable is we need to build 10 to 12 000 units of affordable housing and then in the next decade right and that's something that has not happened in the last 15 years we've seen since around the the, the great recession in 2008 we've seen a significant reduction in that and we're feeling the pinch now so that's one of the most significant changes that i plan to see um you know 10 years from now the comprehensive plan in 2017 argued that about 2,500 housing units in the next 10 years would do the trick. Well, that was incorrect. We were clearly seeing that live out in real time. So we need to we need to be bold with our housing uh, policies. And, and the way I think to get to those 10,000 to 12,000 units of affordable housing in the next 10 years, and I say affordable because right now it's so inflated. I'm also including missing middle market rate housing um, is our land use, right? Um, and we're seeing other cities tackle this. Minneapolis just did a full rezone of their city to make it streamlined. I believe there is not a, we should do everything in our power to make sure we can build housing in every part of the city. There's the obvious exceptions like our parks. We love our parks. I certainly wouldn't make that argument, but there are huge swaths of our city where you cannot build housing. And then we talk about, we have a housing crisis. And then we talk about how our taxes are going up, right? So these are pretty common sense things that we can do today and to your question, a decade from now, we're going to see really positive results that are going to start to fix decades and decades of bad housing policies. Um, that, you know, I think I've, I've been really open about talking about rezoning right now. You know, a great example is our industrial zones, right? We have light and moderate industrial can't have housing there. A good example is where all the breweries are in East Bayside, yeah. right? So you have housing on one side of the street and then huge chunks of land. You cannot build housing. Big sections of Riverside and Warren Ave, right? Those are on major corridors where public transit can access. 
why are we choosing the status quo when we have we have developers who are ready to work with us right mm -hmm. we have other issues with zoning and permitting that i hope we can get into but yeah. that that is the key to unlocking the potential of this city and we have lots of folks who who want to work in portland uh we have lots of folks who want to build in portland but we are pushing them to westbrook to augusta to other cities because we have a reputation that we need to fix and it's that we're not easy to work with and we also have prohibitive land use policy so for me that's day one we're going to prioritize that lots of other things i would like to do but that is what i plan on doing if we don't do that so if i if i don't get elected if we do stick with the status quo we are on a trajectory that is going to continue to enable people scooping up housing here that is not going to be for long-term use um, we are going to continue, we, we are on the fast track to a San Francisco at a much smaller size, a city that is for elite and a greater metropolitan area where people who work in, city, in the city have to live. And so we're going to encourage automobile use, we're going to encourage sprawl, uh, bad environmental impacts, climate impacts. I mean, that is the trajectory we're on. So that's why we need forward thinking policies and we need a brand new perspective for the Portland of tomorrow. Because while I love the nostalgia of a Portland past, those days are behind us and it, it's time to get to work. So uh, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of controversy about the, uh, the role of the mayor. Um, uh, we didn't have a mayor for almost 100 years or elect, directly elected mayor. And, and uh, there was, we just went through a charter review project process that was ultimately unsuccessful to give the mayor more power. Um, I think there's still a lot of uh, confusion in the public about uh, what the mayor does, what the mayor's role is, how the mayor influences uh, events. And I wonder what your uh, perspective on this is, is what, what is the job of the mayor and, and um, how does the mayor uh, uh, accomplish that? So in our form of government, I believe it's really important to have whoever's in the role of mayor their number one task is to make sure they are bringing people together to accomplish their policies, right? Their, their vision, their initiatives. And personality plays a huge role in that. So I think one, you need vision, you need a roadmap of this is where I as mayor want us to be in five years and 10 years. And then you have to pull your council on board and you have to pull city staff on board. So I understand there are folks who say, we have a really weak mayor right now. They're one of nine, there's nothing they can do. And I push back on that because the mayor sets the agenda for the council with the city manager. But that means the mayor has the right and the authority to say that they are going to prioritize housing on every agenda. They're going to prioritize the climate on every agenda. They're going to prioritize affordability and every agenda and working closely with the manager to accomplish that. I mean, at the end of the day, five counselors can direct the manager to do what they wish, right? Within the context of our charter and, and policies. Uh, I think we need to, we need someone who's gonna bring people together who is singular in that vision of accomplishing work, right? We cannot be comfortable with inertia because Portlanders are fed up with that. And I, I join them in that. So I think the mayor in its current form actually has a, a lot of potential to get these ambitious uh, agenda items accomplished, but it involves rolling up their sleeves, working really closely with the city manager, whose purview is city staff, the community and, and the council to get that done. So, um, and, and that happens to be what I do. So I'm, I'm comfortable in saying that I think I would actually be a pretty impactful mayor because I've done it as a district councilor already. I've gotten a lot done in three years and I have, I do, you know, district four has my heart. I, I you know, all the districts are beautiful, but you know, we, <laughs> but we, uh, you know, <laughs> I have a, I have an agenda here. So, but you know, I've been able to do that before with staff, with the manager, with the council and the mayor, but this is why we need a mayor with a bold vision who is not here to alienate people. Their, their job is to leave the place better than they found it. Um, I don't know if I would have run if the strong mayor won because it would have become, a, it, it just would have been such a different structure that I think whoever would have become the next mayor would have had four years of, of chaos. 
they would they, they just it would have been so new it would have been there would have been so many moving parts and we're a city of 68,000 people we're, we might be the biggest city in the state we are the biggest city in the state but we're a, we're pretty small which means we can get things done by working closely together. You know, a lot of what you describe is behind the scenes work, uh, working with counselors, working with the manager, um, but there's also a, a public role to the mayor's office that people have expectations that they, that they will hear from the mayor and they haven't always been met. And I wonder how you would approach that part of the job. Yeah, so I try my very best to be the most accessible counselor. It's been a big reason. One of the reasons why I ran is because I didn't feel heard. It was impossible to hear from my council as a business owner, as a constituent. So that's always been really important to me because no one likes to be ignored. Even if you disagree with the person, you should respond to them. And I think the mayor does have that expectation of being accessible. I think the mayor's job is one of the hardest jobs in this country. Any mayor of any city or town, that is the hardest job. You wake up every day and you look around, you're like, what's on fire today? What are we dealing with today? Um, and it's hard to be accessible at all times. Um, I think that's when you have a really good relationship with your counselors, whose job as district counselors is to be boots on the ground. But um, the mayor's um, also meant to call people into City Hall. That's the people's house. Um, one thing I would love to do is change our rules right now. Um, because you're right, behind the scenes is where everything tends to happen. And that's where I think I've been most impactful working behind the scenes and then before you know it the policy is getting voted on but i would love to restructure um the way we do our work um, to resemble augusta a little bit more which we can do and that's instead of you know right now the policy is we have an agenda setting meeting as our one of our first meetings of the year we all have post-its that we put on issues and you know the most post-its get the most issues it's the past two years it's been homelessness housing and climate uh climate and sustainability so and then, you know, the chairs of the committees go and they do their thing and sometimes, you know, they'll send they'll send stuff to the full council as they wish. What I would love to do, and this would be an amazing way not only to get the mayor to work closely with the community and have them be heard, but it would be a really effective way to prevent citizen referenda from showing up every every you know year is to have that agenda setting session in the beginning of the year be the opportunity for the community to work with a counselor on whatever the issue is. Uh, say it's, um, I've been talking about vacancy rates. So say someone's counselors are, oh, I'd love to work with you on vacancy rates. And then I say, I will sponsor that. And at the meeting of the first agenda setting meeting, I, I sponsor that, I give my reason why uh, we should work on it. And I refer it to the Housing and Economic Development Committee. The council then would vote to five votes, send it to the committee. It gets worked on, the, on in the committee. And then if the committee wants, they send it back to the council and the council votes it up or down. That would be extremely impactful because the mayor and the council are, are calling the constituency into city hall and saying, what do you want? What matters to you? And then they're working it. There's lots of opportunities for public engagement. There's lots of opportunities for the council and staff to do their work. And if they want to support it and send it along, they do. And if they don't, then that's, that's also the work. But it diffuses this tension between staff, council, and the community of, well, you're not hearing me. You're not, it's not accessible. So I truly believe City Hall is the people's house. I did that in our, my committee that I chair, Sustainability and Transportation, this year. And it worked. We got a lot of people who showed up. It was like two hours of public comment. And we did adopt some of those items that we worked on this session. So um, I would love to see that be our new process because um, people need to be heard by their electeds. So last question about the mayor. Um, we've had three uh, very different styles of uh, administration. Uh, anything that you look at uh, from the past experience that you'd like to emulate? Is there anything that you want to avoid? That's a good question. That usually means somebody's not going to answer it when they say, when they tell me it's- I usually answer my, uh, yeah. so you know, I think, I think there's something that I think I, we've learned from each mayor that, you know, is commendable. Anyone who raises their hand for public office and does this work, you know, I respect them. But, you know, the first mayor was really good at connecting with Augusta, really focused on that. Um, the second mayor had big ideas and, and wasn't afraid to swing big. The third mayor was 
so good at bringing people to a place where they felt like they could talk to her. They felt like they 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 could rely on her, um, you know, being available. Um, so those are all commendable traits that I think that those are. I mean, those are good for any public figure to have. You know, the, the from vision to um, the you know the day to day. I want, but they also they also had very different times they were serving under. I mean, specifically our, our current mayor was sworn in and then just had the unthinkable happen. Um, now we're at a time where I think there is a sense of urgency that the, at least the first couple of mayors didn't have to deal with, right? Um, and that's just been the last, you know, the last four years I think have really done a, done a number on, you know, every city and town in this country. But I want to be a mayor that is able to pull on the strengths of the previous, but also now it's time to really get to work. I, I want to push for policies that are going to better our constituents. And I'm going to do it in a way where I'm bringing a creative coalition along with me. And I think that is what I would like to bring as the fourth mayor, um, as my strength. Uh, whoever sits in the mayor's seat next has massive challenges that they need to tackle head on. We cannot kick the can down the road anymore. We are possibly beyond a breaking point for a lot of our issues. So that's why we need someone who understands where we came from to know where we're going um, and is not afraid to try. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, I know uh, the, the, the previous mayors are all very big. Uh, they've left big imprints on our community in really different ways. Um, and so, I, I mean, I appreciate everything they've done. I've learned a lot from them. Um, but it's also, again, we're, we're, we're a relatively small city. So I know I'm going to bump into them all the time. And I look forward to calling on them for their insights, um, you know, when the time comes. All right. So you, you've uh, listed off a number of the big challenges um, uh, the city faces. But let's maybe start there. Um, what, what do you, th if you're ranking them, uh, what are the, the biggest challenges for city government, for our, for our community. Yeah, so the, the top two, and they uh, they are very close to each other, is uh, our homelessness crisis and housing affordability. Those are very interconnected, though. Um, one, one does impact the other. Uh, and I've been talking to a lot of Portlanders, going to a lot of doors. Those are the two issues people talk about the most. Um, what we're gonna do to support our unhoused neighbors, how that's impacting our community, and I can't afford to live here anymore. What are you going to do about my taxes? You know that, and so those are those are not mutually exclusive. I think close after those um, are asylum seekers. Are um, you know? Uh, I think this last summer we really saw people for the first time pay attention to our uh, climate crisis in a way they had not. Um, we're seeing the impacts in our island communities and our waterfront. So I think people are are really starting to wonder how the municipal government can. In that, uh, engage in climate work. So those are, I mean, there's lots of others, but if I were to give you the top four, those those are what I believe are the issues that people will be voting on this November. Okay, well, let's start with uh, affordability. Uh, what can the city do to make housing more affordable? Yeah, uh, there's a lot we can do. Um, the first one I already talked about is through recode and uh, rezoning our city, right? If we want housing, we need to incentivize building housing. It's not rocket science, um, but it is hard to move the, or it has been hard to move the needle on doing that. So we're going through a recode right now. Um, you know, I don't believe that'll be something that uh, this council will be voting on just based on the timing of it, but we need to- The current. The current, yeah, yeah. And that's been worked on for as long as I've been on the council. And I still couldn't tell you entirely Kind of what that process looks like and and what to expect from it but i do know and, and i know i had already said this but that that is that is step one in tackling our housing affordability issue we we need to do more to incentivize housing we have you know tiff programs tax increment financing programs those are great for affordable housing but i think we need to be looking at sections of our city where housing makes the most sense right so i talked about east bayside that's a dense walkable neighborhood it's on public transit we should be building there. We should be building all along Forest Ave, right? Think about, uh, it's one of the most heavily trafficked roads in the city. 
There's not a lot of housing along Forest Ave, is there, right? So we should have benefit districts. We should create every opportunity for, you know, Recode Phase 1, one of the big takeaways was ADUs, accessory dwelling units. The state loves ADUs. The city says they love ADUs, but we make it really hard to build an ADU, right, through setbacks of your property. So we need to, we need to absolutely reimagine our permitting and inspections at the city so that we can make it easier for people to build. And I'm not trying to be overly critical, but one of the most common pieces of feedback I get is that our city is really hard to work with. And I'm, I'm quoting someone, it's almost as if their job is to get to know. That is powerful feedback. And not again, not trying to be overly critical, but we have to acknowledge where we are so that we can fix the problem. And so again, everyone wants to work in Portland. It, it's just, we have a cultural issue to work on. And I think once we start to really take it seriously, we have lots of people who want to build in Portland. The city is not a developer, right? Once upon a time, we did have more of a role by having you know, municipal backed mortgages. I'd love to consider bringing that back, giving people the opportunity to, to pursue uh, home ownership if, if that's for them. But um, what we are seeing is, you know, we're seeing referenda around certain issues because we're not doing enough. Right. So we are seeing, you know, rent control is talked about very regularly. And I think the reason why it's being talked about is it's a, it's a very tangible way to enact in the current housing market. Right. But the way it's the most effective is if it would be coupled with significant housing stock. And that is where we're failing as a city. And I, I'll own that. Right. I've only been on the council for three years, but I will own that. We are not doing enough to prioritize and incentivize more housing stock. So I'm sure you've heard the concerns. People say, you know, how can we be building um, um, uh, luxury condominiums, hotel rooms when there's a lack of uh, affordable housing? Um, can the, the, the city government play a role in, in the types of things that are developed? Yes and no. Um, I think this is where you get creative. So ultimately, if you own your if you own a lot and you want to build a hotel on it, that's yours. You can you can do that, right? If you want city subsidy, that's where we get to be involved and say, okay, hold on. Um, and we've done that before. Exactly. Um, but for the most part, you own that property, you want to build luxury housing on it, that's on you. You might you'll go through the planning board, but for the most part, you're not coming to the council unless it's a specific issue. Um, what we can do though is, and I've had a I've heard from a bunch of people, how about you know, for every unit, every hotel room that's built, we take a, a short-term rental off the market, right? I think we need to always come back to the fact that we're in a housing crisis. So everything should be discussed. Everything should be on the table for, for a conversation. Doesn't mean it's gonna be the idea we move forward with, but I think that is my North Star. And I think that's everyone's North Star. Housing affordability, we don't have enough housing. I mean, the city's population right now, as I said, was 68,000. That's not even our highest. It was in, before the 1960s, in the mid 20th century, we were almost 80,000. And you know, Franklin Arterial ripped an entire neighborhood apart. And other, other policies from urban renewal did a lot of damage to our city. So we're not even at the, the, the population peak that we've been at. That's important to remember because, because when people think of when Portland you know, used to be and things were maybe as hard, there's lots of reasons why. But we did this to ourselves with previous generations implementing really harmful policies. So those are opportunities for us to revisit. And I brought that through my committee, it was in the council on, in, in workshop on Monday, that's a transformational project, restoring Franklin Street, right? It's potentially thou, a thousand plus units of, of housing. Um, so a great example of thinking big and um, using, there's a lot of federal funding for it, right? Portlanders aren't gonna have to pay for that in their taxes. Um, so I think it's just really important for us to say, this is a yes end situation um, for us to really tackle our housing. And, and it, again, I'll reiterate, it's gonna take time because it took a long time to get us here. We're talking 15, 20 years. So it's gonna take us five, 10, 15 years to get out of this. But the longer we wait, the worse it's gonna get. Um, so I think that the city needs to be the number one partner, back to your, your question about, you know, what can the city do? The city needs to do everything in our toolbox to be the best partner we can be, to call people in, to say, how do you want it? What, what works and what doesn't? How can we get you to build with us? That maybe the city needs to revisit our, our staff, like our departments, right? 
we, maybe we need to re-engage um, more of a uh, holistic approach to real estate. Maybe we need to pull people in from the creative economy in, in City Hall so that there is someone who's working directly with domain experience on these issues. But um, yeah. what's happening now is, is falling short. And I think, I hope every candidate recognizes that. So, you know, one of the ironies of Portland is the, um, the traditional worker housing neighborhoods that were walkable and accessed by public transit and, and close to um, employment opportunities have become uh, wealthy neighborhoods because they're so desirable. People want to live uh, in a place where they can don't have to get in a car and drive everywhere. Um, and uh, the, the demand for those housing units uh, has priced out the people who, the, the kinds of populations that used to live there and then that would still like to have that kind of lifestyle. Um, but when you talk about density uh, in other parts of the city, I'm talking off the peninsula, um, you run into um, a lot of opposition from neighbors mm -hmm. and um, and maybe some of the the the, the recalcitrants around city staff and the slow the slow walking is in response to uh, what the people have told them they want, which is um, they don't want more density. Um, so looking forward, I, I appreciate you're talking about growth, but but looking forward, how do you uh, see uh, how the city will grow, where the density will happen? You know, are, is it possible to to meet the uh, the the market for people who want to have a, uh, a an urban lifestyle um, in a city that has a tradition of uh, um, almost suburban development? Yeah. I mean, great question. And this is the work I did when I was with the Smart Growth Organization working in communities all over Maine. How do we grow while preserving what we love about this place, right? And I'm, I'm an off-peninsula counselor. I live in Back Cove. And we have predominantly single-family homes. My street's a great example. Lots of single-family homes on one section of the street. And then built right into it, lots of multis, four units, five units, ten units, right? It, it makes sense for our community. But that when that community, you know, got going, it was mostly just single family, uh, you know, 30s, 40s and 50s uh, capes, right? Um, and with large lots, big, you know, I think a lot of people walking around can't tell the difference of an R3 versus an R5, except maybe the, the lawn is a little bit smaller. But, you know, you're right. People do choose to live in certain neighborhoods because they want that character of the neighborhood. I am in no way, shape, or form <laughs> saying that I want to build, you know, a tower in an off-peninsula district. That would make no sense, not only politically, but in terms of the land use. That that just doesn't make sense. I don't that I don't know anyone who's advocating for that. But what I do know is that we have lots of vacant parking lots in downtown Portland. Lots of them are municipally owned parking garages that are empty a lot. So you know, we talk about oh, my taxes went up. Oh, we talk about affordability. And then we don't do anything in the places that are the lowest hanging fruit to actually, you know, move the needle on it. So I think we have to start where where it makes the most sense. Um, I would be pretty surprised if there was pushback from the community saying, you know, Forest Ave's already a highway. Why aren't we having dense housing all along? And I think most people can get on board with that. It's on public transit, right? We want to incentivize those corridors. Same for Warren and Riverside. I think that those are, we, I mean, we have, we have industrial, some industrial businesses in a, in a fairly vacant technology park. Like I don't, I don't think that those areas are going to really impact, developing those areas are not going to impact neighborhoods uh, negatively for the most part. I think that we need to be intentional with uh, our land use. People love their communities for very nuanced reasons. I mean, Munjoy Hill and the, and the Western Prom have a lot of similarities, but also they have a lot of differences. And it's the nuance of those communities that people want to live there, right? And the same could be said of Deering Center or back over wherever. So I think we need to allow people to expand within their footprint a little bit, but keep it reasonable, right? That being said, I don't think if there's a, you know, if there's a four unit, five unit multi, in Deering Center, I don't think that's out of character. I think that adds value. Um, but I also understand change is hard. It, it could be scary. It's also inevitable. So if we're going to change, we need to control the path forward. We need to own 
what our roadmap is going to be. And this hodgepodge, no vision is going to result in, in some bad policies. And that's, again, why I keep coming back to we need a vision for our zoning. We need a vision in our, with our mayor. Um, we need someone who understands and is talking about where we're going and inviting people in to be a part of that when it comes to housing. Isn't that what the Recode project is supposed to provide? Supposed to. I've been on the council for three years. We've had two report outs, two workshops. Right now, the text is out there, but there's no map. That's one of the departments the council has no oversight into. I've asked every year for the mayor to appoint an ad hoc committee of Recode. Every year. And every year I'm told no. And that's a problem for me. And that's a problem for Portlanders. People want to know what staff's working on. I, I don't think anything bad is going on, but I think there's a lot of time, money, and resources that's going into that work for what should be a transformational policy initiative. And the council do, you know, does not have say. That's where the mayor's role is very impactful. The mayor appoints committees. The mayor, the mayor has a say in that. Um, and so that that is where I would be different because your counselor should be able to answer the question if you go up to them and say, hey, where are we at with Recode? You shouldn't have to be able to like get information a little over here and a little over there to put, put pieces together. For me, that's not good governance. Um, and so that needs to change. Wait, so where is the breakdown happening? Is it between staff and the electeds or is it? Uh, I mean, I think um, maybe a combination of both. I think, again, back to your earlier question, I think that's where the mayor plays a really intricate role of bringing the council and staff together with the manager as, as you know, the the most uh, powerful position on city staff. Um, so I, I, I think that's where the unified vision, the, the coalition building gets at that because we're, we're, we are bringing people together for, for addressing this together. You know, I think there's an expectation after at least a decade of, um, I'll, I'll just be honest, when I was elected, there was a policy. City staff do not talk to counselors. Do not talk to them. If you talk to those counselors, you're in trouble. That is not healthy. And we're slowly working through it. We're getting there. This isn't a secret, by the way. Like this is this is just people know it. And I think people are finally walking through it and saying, oh, well, that was dysfunctional. <laughs> that didn't help. So we, we're getting there. Cultural organizational change takes time. But um, I can't tell you how many times I've asked for us to have, you know, obviously state law prohibits three counselors from convening. And I understand that. But I can't tell you how many times I've asked for uh, us to have a close relationship with senior leadership at City Hall because that's how we get stuff done. One of the best parts of having a coffee shop was people would just come in and we, we would catch up. We would catch up with city staff and I. And it was great. Um, and, you know, I do have a really good relationship with most city staff, but I think structurally the institution as it currently exists is councils over here, staffs over here, mayor, manager, and then they sort of decide what we're working on together and what we're not. And I'm don't get me wrong, it can be really challenging. I mean, we are, electeds are notorious for having some big personalities and being tough to work with. Uh, I'll, I'll own my part, but you know. So I, I think, again, that's the reason why we're about, we're talking about this, this massive policy recommendation that's coming out soon, and we can't really speak to it in depth, is a symptom of an internal structure that is not meant to be super uh, transparent and accessible. And I, I will change that, especially on issues like this one, which are, again, once in a generation. I'd like to shift to a, um, a related issue, uh, which is the, the encampments, the tents. Uh, I have never seen such visible signs of homelessness. Uh, uh, it appears to be getting worse. We've put a lot of effort into, as a city, into dealing with homelessness and uh, whatever it is we've done is not working. And uh, I wonder if I could just get you to explain what we can do going forward, starting right now uh, to uh, deal with this very sensitive, complex, complex issue um, and obviously great need. This is going to be one of the biggest issues Portlanders are thinking about when they when they cast their vote in November. And this is not just a Portland issue. We are seeing this in cities and towns everywhere. Portland does have a huge heart. And I meant what I said before, we are a city of helpers. And we we I feel like right now in the last summer, I agree with you 100%. I've never seen it like this before in Portland. 
Um, there's a couple of variables as to why, and I won't go too deeply into it, but a combination of we are the service center. Portland committed 40 years ago to have a municipal shelter. Um, other, you see Lewiston City Council voted 5-2 a couple months ago not to open a shelter, even though they had state funding. Cape Elizabeth last year chose not to build hundreds of units of affordable housing, right? So you have our neighbors who are saying, no, this is Portland's problem. Um, and then also have something to say about Portland when we have encampments popping up. Um, but Portland punches above its weight. We always have. We're at three times our capacity. City staff works endlessly to achieve this. Our homeless services shelter was at capacity day one when it opened in March. Over 60% of the people at the shelter are asylum seekers who have very different needs from our unhoused neighbors. So what we're seeing right now is two underserved populations with very different needs at odds with each other. And the community is trying to make sense of it. Um, we are doing, we are making some, some moves now to mitigate that. We're opening a new shelter for asylum seekers on Riverside um, for 180 beds to open capacity at the shelter so that people aren't on the streets, right? Because right now we, we just don't have beds, but, and this is, this is where my plans come in. We know data shows us that emergency housing on its own is not, it's just not going to do it. Transitional housing coupled with housing first policies is how we are going to meet the moment. And so there, this has been done in other cities, right? Denver, San Antonio, and we've even been talking about it with GP Cog, the greater Portland council of governments. So I'm proposing that we prioritize 100 units of micro efficient tiny homes with, with wraparound services as the solution to the emergency shelter barrier, right? Because people can't go to the emergency shelter for lots of reasons. If you're with your partner, you'd have to be broken up. That's probably not going to be okay for a lot of people. Um, you might be using still. You might be, you might have a dog. You might not have a place to store your, your, belongings, right? There's lots of reasons that a, an emergency shelter is not your answer. So transitional housing with wraparound services is the solution for a lot of this. There is state funding for it. I believe there's about $13 million that's been allocated from Augusta for housing first policies and something like another $70 million for communities who are addressing their affordable housing crisis. So um, there's three lanes of this. There's emergency housing, transitional housing and permanent. Right now we're coming at it with just one. We've talked about what we need to do in the next 10 years for the permanent, for everyone. But in terms of right now, the inflammation, we are seeing encampments because people are not getting access. And so that's 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 the key. That's how we're gonna do it. And it's, you know, they're quoted to be about $44,000 per unit. Um, we're gonna do 100 of them, it's just shy of $5 million. We have $9 million in the housing trust fund at the municipal level, but then again, we have that 13 million and that 70 million at the state. And the state wants, the state wants to see the municipality take the lead, right? And Portland already is, that's kind of what we do. We take the lead. But what I also wanna do is call in the region. This is not Portland only, right? I've been walking around a lot of the encampments, talking to people, trying to help out where I can, listening to them. A lot of people are here from Lewiston, they don't want to be in Portland. They want to be at home, right? There's someone I was talking to the other day who's 40 years old and, and hurt themselves two years ago and got uh, addicted to, to pills. And their, their life was, was stable and it was just like that. And now they are in an encampment and they don't want to be there. Right? They want to be at home. They want, to, they want to be in their community, but their community's not actively tackling this, right? Portland can't make another city or town do anything, but we can be a good partner and we can reach out and say, how are we gonna work together to help both of our constituents? Because what's happening right now is not working. Um, so this really is a regional approach. We need to work closer with Augusta and take them at their word when they say they wanna help. Portland cannot point fingers. That's not, that is not how we are gonna call people in to help us. We can't say you're not doing enough. We need to say, okay, this you're going to help with money. You're going to help with, with, great. That's we'll take it. We'll work with you on that, and we'll take it from there. And we'll partner with organizations that that are here in this work with us. But again, there are there are solutions to these issues. Doing nothing is why we are seeing this significant increase in encampments and and we are doing a lot with within the context of what our current policies dictate i, I certainly want to be clear about that
We are doing a lot. We're doing more than anyone else as a city, but it's it's not meeting the moment because it's it's too focused on one part of the housing equation. You know, you talk about the the three parts, and um, uh, certainly intertwined with this problem is untreated mental illness and um, and substance use and. I know you don't want to point fingers at Augusta, but those are really state responsibilities. And uh, clearly, uh, it's not working <clears throat> to the extent of what, what's going on. It's not, it's not uh, making the problem less. Um, and I wonder if there are things that can be done on the municipal level uh, regarding the treatment. Um, a number of cities uh, have, um, uh, in Canada, there are um, uh, safe injection sites uh, in, in several cities, and there are other uh, kinds of local level uh, projects that are done to to deal with the um, with the uh, with the fallout from um, inaction at higher levels. And I'm wondering if if you could see Portland playing a more active role. Well, I'm certainly not letting Augusta off the hook with being a part of the, with uh, with you know because you're totally right. There are three crises happening at the same time housing, substance abuse, and mental health. And that's why my proposal involves wraparound services, right? If someone is being, whether they're moved from emergency housing to transition- Provided by who? Uh, I mean, that would be the combination of the state and the city and service providers, right? This is also where, this is a public-public and a public-private partnership. Because again, Portland's not doing it on their own. Um, and there are organizations who we work with pretty closely now at the ECRT and at the state level. So no, 100% Augusta has to be a part of our solution here through providing services for substance abuse and, and mental health. Um, I, I know enough about safe injection sites to have a, a working knowledge of it. I believe last year, the council's health and human services and public safety committee had a presentation or, or they were entertaining a presentation. Um, I don't believe that they were able to have that conversation, but right now what we're seeing is very active public substance abuse happening in parks and streets like it's just everywhere right we are in a precarious situation because of uh the attorney general's protocol of what we can and cannot do in terms of response from the portland police um so i actually met with the new police chief a couple weeks ago he obviously was only a couple weeks in welcome to portland what are you going to do about all this um and so i'm actively working with the manager the police chief um, to, um, I believe we can expect a report out in the near future on an analysis. I've also been discussing with the, the district attorney um, that interpretation because we are in a very um, gray area. But for me, I'll, I'll just speak personally of what I think. Uh, if I'm seeing someone actively using in public, if I'm seeing someone have, um, you know, uh, struggling with mental health publicly, if I'm seeing someone um, elevated, escalated, endangering themselves or others in the community, that's not okay. That is just not okay. And, and similarly, I'll just be honest, being okay with people living in tents is not okay with me because that means we have, we have not only have we failed at prioritizing housing first, but we're okay with saying, mm, maybe we aren't gonna fix this, so let's just settle with what we've got. And I'm just speaking as a person who lives in Portland and my my personal beliefs of what I think we should be doing. So um, the tents are here now. Uh, uh, building new housing first projects is a multi-year pro project, correct? I mean, yes, with the exception of the the proposal from GP Cog is is a pretty quick turnaround. Yeah. Land use is the biggest barrier there. It all comes back to land yeah, use. Exactly, yeah. um, but um, so that that potentially could be something that happens within a year, like very quick. Um, so uh, you're right, though. Again, this is over a decade of it being ignored at the state and federal level. This is allowing major corporations to get people hooked on on addictive medicine, not, not, not medicine, addictive drugs that are ruining their lives. And this is a failure uh, of our society from actually caring for people. And so for me, it's really important that we approach all of this with care in mind. And I think being okay with people just existing in a tent with no support or services other than getting very basic needs met. We're bringing them food, we're bringing them water. We're trying to figure out how to get infrastructure for restrooms and showers. That is just, that's a failure for me, right? 
I want someone to have a home. I want someone to be able to get a place where they can get mail sent to them, where they can get a job, where they can take advantage of um, you know, our awesome education system with adult public uh, adult ed. You know, I want I want to give people a shot. And just because they're in this part of their life where for whatever reason the floor fell out from under them, I'm just not okay with it. And, and this I will say this is near and dear to my heart. I care a lot about making sure people are housed and cared for and get access to the services that they need. Um, I know it's extremely difficult, but uh, I think that, again, I, I have to keep coming back to the fact that there's a lot we can do, but it, it's going to involve all of us coming together and implementing some big ideas. And that's why I think this pilot is the only option we have. I mean, we can we can just break up encampments left and right. You know what that's going to do? It's going to move people elsewhere. They're just going to go elsewhere, and they're in within the city, and it's going to cause trauma in the meantime. You, you see, you see an increase of calls to the police department who already have capacity issues. You see other neighbors in other parts of the city say, "Wait, what the heck's going on? Not in my neighborhood." It's just perpetuating a cycle where nothing is changing. So we have. We have to change the issue. We have to get to the root of the issue, not all of the symptoms. And tents are a symptom. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, move to a another related issue, which you already brought up. It's the asylum seekers whose needs are very different. Um, what is the city's uh, responsibility here? And, and what are the opportunities? Um, what are you concerned about when it comes to housing um, yeah. these families? This one is concerning for a couple of reasons because we, and this is a misconception from the public, which I don't blame anyone. It's not like we get an email every morning that says, hello, Portland, Maine, you are receiving X number of people in your community today. Yeah. XO, federal government. It's not, we, we have no idea, right? People show up and, um, and then we have to respond accordingly. So about a year and a half ago, I don't know, a year and three months, um, we, we did change our, our GA policy, our administration of our GA policy, because we, by state law, have to adhere to it. Of course, we're going to. Um, but we ran out of housing. So now our policy is, here's your voucher, which, you know, that's not great, right? We're, we're just, that's also why you're seeing such a significant number of asylum seekers at the shelter, because it's first come, first serve, right? Very low barrier. So part of exacerbating the issue. What I want to do is look at this as an opportunity. We have people who are coming here. Maine is the oldest state. It is the whitest state. And we have a declining population. So let's look at this as an opportunity. We have people who are coming here and they want to be a part of the community and they want to work. Huge issue, though, is the federal government is not moving at all on work regulation, right? People can't work for at least six months, but it's usually more like 12 to 18 months. So you have people who are coming here who want to work, who want to be a part of the community and the economy, and they cannot. And I will give credit where credit's due to Congresswoman Pingree and Senator King, because they are doing a really good job of advocating for this. But what does that mean for the municipality? How does the city of Portland tackle this when this is clearly a federal issue, very much above our pay grade? And Augusta, I feel like, feels the same way. It's not a state issue, it's a federal issue. But at the end of the day, we are where people are coming. So we're trying our best to sort of mitigate the issues that I was describing between our underserved populations, right? But small city. So I've heard all sorts of uh, interesting thoughts on what we can do um, by issuing municipal only work permits and, you know, taking a chance and see if see if that's going to, you know, incentivize the federal government to, to make, uh, you know, movement on this. I think that's risky, but I do appreciate people thinking of thinking outside the box, um, you know, for us, it's it's per capita, we're dealing with this pretty significantly because of our size, right? Um, but I, I want to recognize and I'll continue to say that this is, we have to look at this as an opportunity because if we start to go down the path of, you know, why, you know, why are they coming here? Or, you know, what about Portlanders? That gets dicey real fast. And I know that we are better than that. We have to be, right? So um, I think right now we're doing our absolute best to make sure people have housing and access to, you know, through GA and resources. But this is where working closely 
with our state delegation in Portland and the governor's office um, to make sure that we are in constant communication with each other and making sure that Portland is not the only destination uh, for people who are coming to Maine uh, because there are lots of other cities and towns who I will say are starting to work better with us, right? We're looking at the hotel in Freeport, right? It's tricky because then you all of a sudden have, you know, you have language barriers, you have more, you know, access to resources that are challenging, but this is another example of- No one wants to live in a hotel. Uh, you can't cook, you can't, uh, they can't walk anywhere. Exactly, exactly. Those are all like the expo, that was short term. Hotels, this is short term, but because we aren't looking at this from a big picture, then that's why we're not getting at it. And again, not to always come back to this with your last two issues, transitional housing meets the needs for both of these populations in different ways. And it is affordable and it is paid for. And I, I'm, I am all ears. If someone has an idea that is great, we should go with it, let's go with it. But right now all signs are pointing to this is the next step. The state's excited about it. I think the region can really engage with it. And it, it feeds two birds with one seed, right? It's taking both of our communities who have different needs and allowing them access to a better quality of life. And just to keep on that systems thinking, Permanent housing is the goal for everyone. Permanent housing is the goal for asylum seekers. It's the permanent, it's the goal for uh, our unhoused neighbors. Our goal is to not always live in, if we're always looking at the emergency shelter, the emergency, then it feels like we're constantly in an emergency. And I think it's because we are right now, but we, this is when vision is everything. It's time we have, because we can't, we can't just say no. We can't say we're not gonna do anything about it or you can't come here. That's not on the table. And that's hard for some people to hear, but it's the reality and we have to be very honest about that. So this is why, you know, big, big solutions are, are the only way through this. Glad that you uh, mentioned growth because um, uh, a lot of residents of Portland, longtime residents of Portland have the impression that the city has been growing uh, at an alarming rate. And uh, it hasn't, it's uh, the population has been just about uh, level the last two censuses and um, this, the area, the region has grown. Um, people are coming here every day from across the economic spectrum from uh, asylum seekers to uh, people, remote workers with very high incomes, um, empty nesters, all competing for the same urban housing stock. Um, and uh, I wonder if I could get you again to be specific about what your growth strategy is and um, how big do you think Portland could get without losing the character that's attracting all these people? So I'm a big proponent of smart growth. I do not believe in growth for the sake of growth. That's not because that's when you're going to end up with completely unattainable housing costs. You're going to end up with lots of commercial vacant commercial office space. <laughs> um, so I think we need to be intentional about our growth. And um, I'm glad we're talking about the that we are not at our highest population. The perception that Portland is getting big, I think is because we make every list in that, that that's out there, right? We have the best food, we have the best waterfront. We have, but we also have folks who are scooping up second, third properties, right? So it's like, well, the numbers should tell us that we have enough, but we don't because we're not being equitable in the distribution or the access of our housing units. On top of the fact that we do have a deficit of housing stock, that's, I hope I've been clear on that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I think a lot about my neighbors in Backhoe, right? A lot of people who have lived there, they raised their kids there. They've lived there since the 60s and 70s, right? And now they want to stay there, but they're getting priced out. I do a lot of work with the Aging in Place initiative. I try to be helpful with making sure people, you know, can get their their sidewalks shoveled or get to the grocery store and just sponsored with one of my colleagues uh, funding another full-time position for the Office of Elder Affairs. But we have a lot of people who live in the city and have for a while. And they're they're feeling the pinch and the assumption is well we're growing so quickly that that's why i'm getting pushed out and that's just not true um there's other variables that are contributing the opposite right we're not growing and that's why you're getting pushed out exactly yeah. but then you have the conversation that, that we were talking about a moment ago of, well what is that if you want to build more what does that mean for me and i think we need to just be very clear that it doesn't mean it's not bad it's good. This is a net win for everyone. Your property taxes will go down. The mill rate will go down. You'll have more, like you'll have a more vibrant community. You'll have neighbors. Like 
I think the reluctance for change is so, and, and fear are such powerful motivators for people. We've seen it in all sorts of elections, from candidates to to referenda to ballot items. Like people are afraid, and I think that's why it's our job as candidates or as electeds to meet with people and say, "This is this is what we're looking at doing. What do you think? Explain everything." It's our job to make sure people are fully aware of the reality and then what what we think we should do about it. And also, I mean, I, I hope I've shown on, in my time on the council that I'm always up to learn something new. And if that changes my mind or my vote, so be it. But I, I take it very seriously that it's my job to work with people and let them know this is why things are the way they are. And this is what I think we should do to fix it. And this is why I think you should support it because it benefits you. Um, so, I mean, growth is, listen, if we don't do something, we're going to, like I, are, I already mentioned this, we are not on a great path right now. Um, the trajectory is looking pretty grim. So everyone, it's time to call the entire city to the table uh, to tackle this. Um, I think once people learn more, and I've experienced this doing a lot of doors, talking to people about this, once you have a conversation with people, hear where they're coming from, talk to them about why this is important, nine times out of ten, people feel good about it. Uh, you mentioned referendums a couple of times. Uh, why do we have so many referendums? And um, is that a good thing? And if not, what should we be doing about it? We've seen a spike in referendums for the past few years. Um, the argument at first, my understanding, was that the city was not listening. And um, I agreed with that. I agreed. I think the city previous councils were not known for listening to the constituents of Portland or the entirety of the constituency. Fast forward, um, you know, there were several issues that I was working on in committee in 2021. What year is it? <laughs> uh, 2022. And, you know, those very items for minimum wage to cruise ships both showed up on a referendum while I was actively working on them in committee. So this is when I was like, there's a disconnect. This is being worked on. So what's going on? And I think, you know, my proposal that I shared with you earlier about how I think we should restructure the way our, our rules work, I think would go a really long way because it, it calls people in. It says, oh, no, you have to work with us. As you know, our constituents are our greatest asset. I, anytime I need to get something done in my district, first, the first group of people I reach out to are my constituents because without them, I got nothing. I need them to be um, on the same team as me. So I think referenda, we're in a really unique situation where our referenda process, it's very easy to get an item on referenda, uh, citizen referenda on the ballot in the city of Portland. Unusually easy. I think it might be the easiest in the country. And um, what we're seeing now are groups who are in opposition to each other play a game of tennis. So we have June, we have November, and, and that is getting untenable. I think we shouldn't expect, I'm a fan of referenda. They are a very useful tool. Marriage equality passed in the state of Maine via referenda, right? It should exist and it should be used when appropriate. We cannot, I believe we cannot use referenda to pass policies every, every election. It is like trying to hang a picture on your wall, but instead of using a hammer, you're using a bulldozer. Why would you do that? Um, I, I recognize that there are parts of our community that still don't feel heard. I, I, I totally see that. I, I own it. That's why I'm proposing changes to our rules so that hopefully they can feel more heard. But I think right now we are we are starting to see um, burnout. The community is absolutely done with referenda, which my concern is, God forbid, we need one. People are just going to say no to it because they're they're just done with the concept of it at the municipal level. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to trust. Uh, and that is, you know, I'll tie it back into why we're here today. I think that's a big part of the mayor's role, reestablishing trust with the community. Um, I want you to give me a quick answer on a really complicated question. Uh, uh, short-term rentals, uh, uh, how is, are they a problem? Is it a big problem? Uh, uh, is it, you know, is the regulation sufficient? Is the enforcement sufficient? What, what should we be doing about short-term rentals, given that, as you say, we're in a housing crisis? 
Yes, you, you, you gave me my setup here. We are in a housing crisis, which means we need to revisit everything until we're outside of an out housing crisis, until it's in the rear view mirror. I do think, and this is just from data, that um, we are, uh, our enforcement of our existing uh, ordinance around short-term rentals is, is, is not um, working the way it should. Uh, this summer, there are hundreds of units that have been operating illegally, right? So that's a problem, because not only does that tell me we're not enforcing them, it tells me that people are okay with skirting the law. And if you don't enforce something after you've given them the opportunity to be educated, because you know, I know some people might not know what the law is, then, then we have a problem. So I do think it's time, this council, as long as I've been on it, has not in committee had a conversation around short-term rentals. Um, pretty confusing, if you ask me why. It feels like it's a good time to have the conversation because it's, it's not a one and done. This is an ongoing conversation. I think we have to be really clear about what we're talking about. The island communities, very different short-term rental conversation than when we're talking about downtown or off peninsula, right? And that's where the nuance of community comes in. But I think it is time to have, uh, to revisit the conversation I think that we need to do everything we can to incentivize long-term rentals while acknowledging there are Portlanders who make, who pay their taxes by renting out, you know, a, a room in their house or apartment, or maybe they live in a three unit, uh, they own a three unit and they rent out the second or third for short, short term. But I think most Portlanders, even though I know the short-term rental referendum are the ones that failed, I think most Portlanders are acknowledging that, that what we have right now is, is it, it's an, it's ill-fitted. It's not doing what it needs to be and even if that conversation is simple as okay how are we going to be better about enforcement that's that's great i mean we have we have these rules these ordinances for an example but or for a reason rather but i do think that um the in the in the big picture holistic conversation around housing right now short-term rentals play a pretty big role and in the last 10 years we've seen them do this and right now, globally, we are seeing that short-term rentals are having some unintended consequences on house, local housing markets. So again, my North Star, we are in a housing crisis. We got to take it seriously. And if that means revisiting what we currently have to understand what's a better option for us right now, then I'm, then I'm all in on that. Um, because again, what's happening right now is, is not meeting the moment. Uh, completely unrelated. Uh, we have three high schools. Uh, there's been talk about consolidating them. Uh, do you favor that? Do you have an idea which which high school uh, should be the winner? I'm not going to pick a winner. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's actually really interesting in such a short period of time. I've watched the conversation go from being very reluctant for the community, being very reluctant to having that conversation to it being actively discussed from school board members to parents. I think people are recognizing that it is time and it's, it's time to do that, um, you know, by pulling the community into that conversation. Obviously it's outside of the purview of the council that is school board first. Um, but I, I'm surprised by the number of people who are openly talking about how in favor they are of it. Um, because it's just not the model doesn't work anymore. It's it's pretty it's it's outgrown what it once was. So I don't know. I think those are both pretty unique campuses, Portland and Daring specifically. Um, whatever we do, it needs to be something that we're proud of. If we build a new campus, it needs to be we, we need to make sure we we say, wow, that's our that's our school. We're proud of that thing. And I feel the same way about everything from infrastructure to sidewalk streetlights. But um, I overall, I, I think that the community, it feels like what I'm hearing from a lot of people, people who typically disagree on almost everything, that has become something that a lot of folks are ready to talk about. So I'm, I'm actually excited about that conversation because it feels like one that it needed to be had, so. Yeah. Um, quick one. Uh, it's a ranked choice election. You're going to put yourself first. Who do you put second? Oh, I do like to answer every question that is asked of me. But I think I might pass on this one. Mostly because I haven't actually given it that much thought. Well, you're going to have lots of opportunities to think yeah. about it because uh, you have a number of uh, forums. I will say that. That was, that was a good question. Uh, I guess uh, the the ultimate question for everybody is, um, uh, you know, why do you want to be mayor, and uh, why should we vote for you? 
I think that would be the way to end up uh, yeah, it's a great this way. conversation. You, I love the way you phrased it. Most people say, congratulations, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> like, is, is everything all right? Um, it's a great question. Why Why run for mayor? Why not run for the district four seat again? Or why, why not, you know, be done? I Like I started at the beginning of this conversation, I care so much about municipal government and I care so much about Portland. The city is is so important to me and to everyone in my world even when people get really frustrated with portland and they're angry with us and they're angry at just the state of things they care sometimes they're caring very loudly at me but they care deeply and that is so special how many communities have you traveled to where you can just feel you could be anywhere it doesn't matter like it, it could just be there is no sense of community and this place is just rich with community it's rich with people who want to leave the place better than they found it for me i have and this is one of the reasons why i ran in 2020 for my seat you have two options when you are feeling like something needs to be done or you're overwhelmed or you are you know borderline apathetic you give up you walk away or you do something about it and i'm a candidate for mayor who has concrete plans to solve our biggest issues. I am almost to the point uh, overly detailed with what I think we need to do. And people want that. People are craving that now more than I've ever seen before in our government or even, you know, I've lived in a few places. This, the, the, I've never seen the, the urgency that we're seeing right now. And I'm in it to solve the problems. I want people to rank me as their first vote or their second if if they are looking for someone who's going to try to meet the moment. My campaign is not a laundry list. It's not a wish list. It, it's a promise to Portlanders that we're going to meet the moment and we're going to do it together. So I'm, I'm not doing this for my profile, believe me. <laughs> I never thought I would have this much public attention. I'm not doing this for any reason other than I love this place. I love the people who live here. And I want more people to be able to call this place home if, if they want to. Um, and so I believe it's time for a generational change. I think it's time for us to look forward towards new policies that are common sense and they allow people to, to thrive. Um, I don't think that's a crazy idea. I think that's what most Portlanders want, even if they fall on different parts of the political spectrum. People want to be able to be proud of where they live and they want to be able to say, oh, you know, that's my city. Um, and so that's why I'm running. I'm running to do that because we can do better. And I, I know we can. Um, and I, you know, with, with as much admiration and respect of anyone who's running for this seat or the others, I'm the candidate who's going to do that. Um, so that's why I would like people to vote for me. And I'm, I'm always here to talk to people about what matters to them. Truly, even if we don't agree, I'm here for them. I think we'll, we'll make that the last word. And thank you very much for coming in. And thank you for putting yourself out and running for office. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me.